first in-person conference in uh, two years, I guess. Uh, so Lars wears a number of hats. He's a professor at Cornell, um, but he is also the data editor for the AEA journals, which is American Economic Association journals. There's about nine journals, eight journals, eight journals plus, the proceedings. plus proceedings, eight or nine journals, and they are among the most important journals in economics, um, arguably the, the most important ones. And what Lars, I don't, I don't like to admit it, right? But, but I've actually got an economics degree. Um, I've got an economics PhD, it's in economic history. And one of the reasons I left the field is because I just felt like it, a lot of it was just built on a house of cards, um, that you, you couldn't get any of the data, you couldn't really believe what was being posted in these journals. Um, and so what Lars has managed to do in the past few years, is just remarkable. And he's actually cha completely changed uh, the way that economic research is done. Um, through his work at, as data editor at the AA. So it's, it's truly remarkable and a great honor to have Lars here presenting. So thanks very much, Lars. Okay, do you want to put up my slides for me? No, I've lost them. Okay, there we go. Uh, let me share screen. Everybody see the slides? Not complain now. <laughs> um, okay, so Rowan gives me too much credit because even having a data editor is um, uh, it's a reflection of what was going on in the discipline. So um, there, there, there is that, let me just put it that. Um, so I'll talk about here, and this is why we're in the uh, education um, session here, uh, about how we actually go about doing what Rowan alluded to, and I'll, I'll briefly mention that. Um, so, uh, but of course, in all of this, I'm talking just for myself, but this is based on joint work, which has been revised and resubmitted to, uh, to the journal. Oops, this was sensitive. So um, here are the eight journals that I am the data editor for. So lots of people perceive it, Lars is the data editor for the American Economic Review. Nope, I, I am the data editor for the American Economic Association and all of its journals. And I, um, the position is, is vague enough that I can make more out of it. But one of the things that Rowan alluded to is that I, it's not just about making the analysis reproducible, but also reusable. And so the idea of pushing uh, in many instances, the authors or the data providers to make the data more broadly available is also something that I, I care a lot about and where we have um, some success. Um, here, I'm just going to flash the, the key elements of the policy um, that uh, when, when I became data editor, we rewrote somewhat, uh, in particular because uh, one of uh, my um, key observations is that a lot of data that we think of as publicly accessible is actually not as accessible as we would like it to be. And on the other hand, research using data that is not accessible, and just think here of, of uh, uh, data that has personal identifiers or things like that, or a lot of the work that's being done with administrative data, while not universally downloadable by just anybody, is accessible to thousands of researchers. And whether we should think of that as fundamentally not reproducible or reproducible, uh, I tend to think of it the, the other way. Um, and we have lots of evidence, and I'll get to that in terms of what my students do, uh, what that means. Um, now, the context here is quite different in terms of the setup. You guys were talking about uh, students who sign up for your class uh, and then get taught reproducible methods. Um, I pay students and I um, have a stranglehold on authors because if it weren't for my acceptance, they don't get published. Uh, you would be surprised what that gets in terms of compliance. Um, so the generic process is that once somebody has a uh, paper conditionally accepted, and I have absolutely no input at this point into the evaluation by the reviewers. Uh, so the, the whole idea is that it's conditionally accepted subject to some reproducibility checks that in a nutshell, I'm gonna throw up here on the screen and we're gonna walk through this because this is the workflow that my students then also work through, uh, walk through. So um, it's not just conducting computational reproducibility. It starts by first figuring out what data is actually being used. Um, and that 
can sometimes be a bit confusing. Um, there is a, a, a project there that I can talk to at the end that, that um, at some point in time I need to get to. Uh, we asked the students to read the paper and identify any clearly identified data set. And then of course, we then need to identify, can we get at the data set? Because not every replication package, actually uh, most replication packages don't have all the data for a variety of reasons. So then the obvious question is, can we access the data? Um, and if it's just, oh yeah, go to IPMS, download some data, it's not in the package, but you can just download it, then we can access the data and we proceed to conduct a reproducibility check. But circling back to that data citation and provenance stuff, we actually care about data citation. Most people were not trained on data citation, and so most manuscripts will be void of all data citations. And so we actually uh, figure out, are they citing the data? Are they citing the paper, et cetera, and, and put a report on that into the final report that I'll get to. Again, this is done by the students. Um, so if we can't ourselves access the data, we will tr be on the lookout for third parties who can. Um, and on, in an average year, about 50 papers will go out to some third party replicator who works with us in some guise. Um, and we can walk through that. Um, they essentially then do the same thing as the students do. Um, and if we can't, then we just do a, a basic code check. Does it look like there's enough documentation of the code that we think that every table that should be somehow created by the code is actually being created by the code, even if we can't run the code. So it's a very simplistic analysis, but it also fails surprisingly often. Um, this is where all those students that are going through the data citation, uh, data, uh, data science classes that you guys are teaching, hopefully down in the future, will not forget to document what program created table three. Um, many seasoned uh, researchers still forget to do that. Um, so to give you some idea on why I call this at scale, um, in July 2019, we started doing this for all of the articles going through uh, six of the journals, and we then added in the Journal of Economic Literature and Journal of Economic Perspective, Perspectives a bit later. They had a slightly different editorial process. Um, so we've done about a thousand manuscripts by now. Um, Manuscripts go through potentially multiple rounds, so we have conducted about 1,500 reproducibility checks. Um, some of those are, of course, at any point in time still in progress, but that, that's a lot, right? So um, in any given year, that's about 500 requests, about 400 manuscripts, and that's being done by, over the course of a year, about 40 students, right? At any given point in time, I'll have 25 in my lab, um, but they rotate off for various reasons. Um, and so uh, I just certified what, whom I paid over the last 12 months, and that was 44. So that made it into the report. Uh, that's, at, that's typical now for about two years. Uh, so two years is not a long time. We'll see how this evolves and stuff like that. Um, and I can say about the varying quality in cohorts and how in, uh, midterms wreak havoc on my production schedule. Um, so the process, as I just outlined, we start with data citation analysis. We figure out, can we get at the code? If we can, we conduct the reproducibility check. And something should be happening here. There we go. Um, and if not, we contact that third party that can conduct an acceptable reproducibility check as well. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about that, except for the fact that some of these third parties are actually graduate students. Our criterion is that it's sufficiently arm's length. Okay, So the graduate student cannot have been involved in the original analysis. It has to be a new graduate student. The way I sell this to researchers to sort of, hey, why don't you pay your new graduate student some hours to check the code for me, is that I tell them this is really good training to get them to be your next RA on this particular project. Um, and um, that works pretty well. So uh, then there's also the code check. Uh, we can have a sidebar on that we've uh, figured out for Stata a, a few ways to figure out what are all the packages that are being called that are not declared because in contrast to Python or to R, you don't actually have to declare that you're using a library or a package or something like that. And that came out of an undergraduate assistant who was frustrated by all the times that her code failed after three days of running on a package that wasn't declared and wasn't installed. 
Um, so uh, there's also some nice outcomes from here. And so in the end, we uh, wrapped it all up into a report and sent it back to the authors. Okay. Um, just to point out that the template report that we get to them, and I'll get to how that's important, is out there. Anybody want to go through that, run it themselves, uh, it's there. Um, okay, so who? Um, I actually chose to rely on undergraduates intentionally. Uh, I could have done this with graduate students, but um, this is maybe where being in, uh, in economics comes into play. This is not something that most graduate students will use to find a job. Um, and so the time I have with graduate students, I always have one graduate student who helps me with this, is by design limited because they have a thesis to write. And the thesis can't be about I replicated 500 papers. That's not an economics thesis. And so the graduate students aren't, this is not their primary job. Um, and so um, I'd still need quite a few graduate students and uh, Cornell has a lot of graduate students, but I'd still be dipping very deeply into that pool to get enough to, to do all of this. But it has a, a, a ton of uh, undergraduates as well. And I took as the approach, we can do this. I didn't go blindly into that because I'd done a couple of pilot projects over summers where we did actually do this with undergraduates. And I thought, let's do this. So as it turns out, that's of course very good training for them as well. And so we essentially end up training the graduate students either in the initial training or through practice on best practices, on communication skills, on data acumen, on data management and curation sometimes, as well as at least observationally workflow and reproducibility skills. Now we have our own reproducible process, right? And they learn that as well, um, but they also observe how researchers got to the point where it's actually an article, okay? Um, I believe, and I have some anecdotal evidence, I'll, I'll just get to at the very end, that this is transferable to non-academic workplace and is useful overall as a study as well, even if it's not explicitly designed to be a class that I teach, but rather um, something. So to some extent, the lab targets both ends of the academic pipeline. Um, I use the skills of the undergraduates who at some point in time are going to write papers that have replication packages at the very end of that package, okay? One of the reasons I can do this relatively straightforwardly is because there's not a huge amount of diversity in software. Most of it is Stata, some of it is MATLAB, and then there's a sprinkling of other things. Um, and should that be the case? Not really, um, but that's, that's a different story. Uh, so it's mostly Stata MATLAB, and I should, point out also mostly desktop oriented. Now, um, that's probably true in some aspects of data science as well, but you feel the pinch of that when you actually have to do 500 papers a year um, because that becomes an impediment. Uh, a readme that says uh, hit control H to select all the code then hit the little green triangle at the top to run the code just is not very reproducible even though fundamentally it could be run in a variety of ways. Um, but that also means that I don't need already trained data science students because as long as they have figured out something about how desktop software works, they're probably trainable for my purposes, okay? And uh, as it turns out, initially we, we cast the net more widely to recruit uh, undergraduates and uh, those folks who are deeply into computer science or into engineering that have lots of Java and C++ experience are actually not very useful for following through the mind process of most uh, seasoned academics. Um, Students are not expected to master these programs. They're, they're supposed to be able to run them. Um, they're not supposed to be proficient programmers. They're not supposed to reprogram the whole thing. They're, we're doing computational reproducibility. What is there actually generate the figures, but all the figures were generated by something that's there, okay? So uh, the fact that you know all of these software pieces have similar desktop interfaces actually helps with that. We're actually trying to step a bit away from using desktop software and to trying to automate this. So having gone through a thousand papers now gives us a, a good grasp of, is that actually feasible and how to go about that? So, so that's my, my non let's check the data project for this year is how to streamline some of these things uh, using uh, tools in the cloud within, um, we're, we don't actually use GitHub, we use Bitbucket, but the same thing, automated tools that once we pop data and code in, it actually checks for, our, for, for us. And that again, makes our work more efficient, but it hopefully then goes back to, uh, to researchers as well. So, oh, this is how they do it. I can self-check that and we'll get to that. 
Okay, so these are the elements we recruit on. This is who we recruit out there. Here's our actual hiring. So we hire three times a year. Um, we hire um, during the fall and, and winter semester and for the summer as well. And uh, as it turns out, I'll go into what we teach them because in all of these classes, I cannot rely on what's already been taught in all the fabulous classes that are available at Cornell. I still have to teach them quite a lot myself, starting with Git. Uh, we select based on uh, some knowledge of some graphical uh, software. And so we can say R because most of the time people nowadays think that's R Studio. Um, we say that you know having some command line experience is useful. Most don't. We um, added in that some familiarity with the Windows desktop was necessary because we actually used the remote Windows servers at Cornell for doing some of this. And after one summer where all of my RAs had never touched a Windows computer, I put that into the requirements. Um, okay, so um, the way we sell this as a nice job for the students is that there is no fixed time that you have to do the work. There's flexibility in scheduling. And that's why midterms wreak havoc on my schedule because I tell them, look, you're here for academia, go off and do your midterm, come back to the paper you're replicating after that. Just don't ghost me. Uh, so most people don't ghost me. Um, they have a lot of flexibility in the scheduling. There's two fixed points during the week that I'll get to. Uh, they're not paid a humongous amount of money, but they're not paid at the bottom of the wage scale either. So um, this is, uh, you know, what they see. Um, we just throw our job posting out there into the sort of standard pool. Uh, we actually ignore field in terms of recruiting. In practice, we have had folks from uh, economics, sociology, statistics, uh, computer science, etc. We also don't say a specific experience, and so we can't rely on them having had some sort of advanced statistics courses or things like that. De facto, we tend to hire sophomores and juniors simply because after the training, they stay with us for a while, so it's worth our while to train them up. We have a few seniors, we'll hire them fall, definitely not in winter because they'll be around for three months and then gone again. Um, we have occasionally had freshmen who had the appropriate qualifications. When we have hired freshmen, they were awesome. Uh, but most freshmen just don't have the exposure to this kind of stuff yet. Um, and there on the right is it's mostly economics. Obviously, uh, they get attracted to some of that. But there's quite a bit of statistics, and information science uh, majors mentioned. Often these are dual majors. Um, and the four, uh, none of these others are typically policy and, and uh, sociology. OK, so um, we have to upskill them. And this is training that's at the start of the whole uh, process. And we call it upscaling because it's not a test. Our goal is to just give them the skills so that they get out. And we have really good experience. I, I, I'd say that mostly those that we lose are those that didn't expect that this is so computer oriented. Um, so that's probably a good thing to do. Uh, but most of the other ones, we actually uh, managed to skill up and find uh, some, some useful use of them uh, over the course of that in the lab. So we start out with a full day. Um, actually, we start before the full day with a video lecture that I recorded a while ago to give them background on what is this whole reproducibility crisis and stuff like that. And then we walk them through all the skills that we need them uh, to have. Um, we have uh, a template readme that a couple of data editors and I put out uh, now a year ago that um, if you haven't seen it, have a look at it, but that sort of encapsulates what we're looking for in a readme and that's uh, what we kind of baseline it on. And uh, more and more researchers are actually using it. And those packages are really a lot better. Uh, we introduce them to reproducible practices to the extent that they need to do a few of those and that they should recognize when the authors did not do them. But we don't go deep in there. Half an hour is clearly not enough for that. So we barely scratch the surface. We spend an hour on data provenance and data citations. Um, again, it's all reinforced over the course of what they're going to do in the lab. We spend an hour on command line, Git, Markdown, and version control combined, right? So clearly, we're just giving them the very, very basic of stuff. I should note here that we teach Git on the command line precisely because we cannot guarantee that they have a controlled environment. Uh, as Maria just had, it's marvelous when you have a controlled environment, but we don't actually because we go where the computation requires us to go. So that means that a student might run it on their Mac laptop, they might run it on the Windows server, it might be run on our Linux cluster, it might be run in the cloud. And so the one thing that's in common across all of these is if you could type git commit, you git committed. Um, and so that's kind of what we, what we tell them to use. 
And then we walk them first uh, a dry run through a prototypical replication report, and then the actual process of what it means to walk through that process I threw up on the screen earlier. Um, block two, as I call it, are days two and four. After this really quick walkthrough, we walk them through the process again three times using some very, very simple articles. Uh, one is a fake article. It just basically illustrates here's data, here's data, here's how you run this, here's how you write the report. But we tell them here's the structured guideline and behind that is a, is a very step-by-step -step, uh, curriculum that I'll link to at the end of, the, of, of this as well. Um, work through it autonomously, figure it out. Uh, we've told you everything that you get to hear, look at the recordings again, walk through that first case. It's really simple. There are two errors in there, find it. Right. And then they do that. They then have an hour long session with one of the existing RAs who's been at the lab for a while. They then go off and work on their own again. And then we sort of wrap up the whole session for each of these papers with an hour long debrief session. And here's everything that I think you probably got wrong the first time around. And that's fine. Feedback in that style from me and, and from the RA. And then when they finally, after that, submit their first report, as they will over and over and over again in the lab, they will also get individualized feedback from the, from the graduate student, as well as a sheet of here's all the things that usually go wrong. Might not have gone wrong in yours, but here's what usually goes wrong here. And getting it wrong is fine here, right? Because again, we don't know what they're going to be facing. There is no standard template of what we're observing at the uh, ingest, right? So first one is a very simple Stata one. Second one is a very simple MATLAB one. These runs in seconds. So it's basically about the whole uh, process flow. And the third one is a confidential data one where they can't run the data. And so they have to assess the code and the data citations and all that. Okay. And I probably need to speed up a bit. Um, then they're essentially done with our very fast training and they get to work on actual articles, but they're not going to be randomly allocated these articles. We know they're the newbies. We try and filter out articles that we think that they can do and work with them a bit more intensely than we normally do as part of the lab. So again, they get individualized feedback. Uh, we look at their reports uh, with, in a lot more detail, give them constructive feedback about here, this was different, remember this in the, in the training, et cetera, and, and reinforce those particular attitudes, right? And then after two weeks of that, that's one or two additional papers there in the overall process uh, in there. Okay, so um, accessing data, getting to some of the things that they learn in the lab as well that are implicit, not explicit. So accessing data, the way I sort of visualize these kinds of things, there's a ton of things that make data difficult of access, but you can collapse it all into a time dimension, right? You have a year and a half long application process, or you have to work with your uh, university uh, contracting for a month to, to buy some data or whatever. So we think of it as, as, as a grade of, of time. And that of course correlates with how many people can potentially in the universe access these data. We're going to encounter all of these, right? You can put labels on some of these areas, but it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, right? You can have open access data that's difficult to access because it's big, or you might have what people think of as open access data, but you still have to sign up and then figure out where to download it to, et cetera. You might have FSRDCs or things like that, or like the Canadian RDCs, and you might have firm data. And I sort of notionally put them in some of these places, but there's firm data that's all the way up on the top left. And there's, um, you know, there's some open data that's, that's at the bottom. If you think of you ran a survey, um, the confidential information of that survey is accessible by a handful of people. And so it really is at, at the bottom, right? And you have to put an IRB and all that sorts of kind of things. Okay, let me skip over that. Um, so the first thing that students learn is how to figure out, can we actually get at the data, right? And we have uh, data citations are the first step for that, um, but it's not the only thing. So the readme has to have additional information. Uh, we have a template again of here's all the possible scenarios that can happen in terms of data citations and how they correlate with how data can be accessed. And then um, they need to trace down that data and, and acquire it. To the extent that we've reviewed it at a preliminary report, the student goes out and gets the data. Right, And so frequently used data by researchers is going to be frequently encountered by these students and it's going to happen over and over and over again. Um, and just to sort of throw up a, this 
some of the usual culprits, IPMS, of course, the DHS program of, of the demographic and health surveys uh, comes up quite frequently. And there is a request that needs to be put in for every paper that we reproduce here. Uh, World Bank data, uh, World Development Indicators doesn't have an API, you have to download it every time, and so we need information, all those kinds of things. Those are just a few of those that come out. And the download process, the access process, all that is handled by the student with our supervision, of course. Right. So the ability to recognize data access conditions, the ability to request and obtain data, to be cognizant that this is not data that you can just ship around, uh, the importance of an accurate description, because they're at the receiving end of an inaccurate description. And I can't figure this out. And I said, well, put it in the report and we'll do a second round. Right? And so then we get to the reproducibility check. Um, that can be as simple as running a main program. If you have a fully reproducible single uh, Jupyter notebook or an R markdown, neither of which we see a lot, or just some main program, that's all fine. But most of the time, it's not fine. Uh, and so there, it can be a, as complex as running and babysitting a dozen programs. Think of the stuff that graduate students do over the course of four years of graduate studies that all shows up in one paper. They started in Stata, then learned that this cool thing R exists, then had this map that they had to do in ArcGIS, and they went to the library, and the library helped them do it, but they didn't write code for that and all those kinds of things. So certain activities are done by hand. Downloading from the world development indicators has to be done by hand. So um, these are all things that some of them get exposed to, not everybody. <clears throat> we don't improve at our stage on the author's methods. Um, if it says load up the shape file and select this layer and do those other things, it should be described and the student will follow it. Uh, that is still reproducibility. It's just not the most efficient reproducibility. And when things fail, they need to debug stuff, right? And so uh, there are a bunch of questions that always come up early on because those are errors that always show up in author's code and there's a quick thing to debug it. And uh, we have a wiki for that. And some point in time, there will be some guidance to authors about the top five things to avoid, which will probably generate another Twitter story. <laughs> um, one key aspect that they learn here is how to communicate their problems with others. They don't work in a shared computing environment. I can't look over their shoulder, uh, especially not during, um, during COVID. And so the ability to capture what the error is and to communicate it to uh, others in the group, uh, to the graduate student, to me, um, without us seeing the whole part of it um, is, is one important aspect to this. This is where reproducibility of what they're doing comes into play because we put all the code and all the changes they make to the code into a Git repository. We tell them to commit the logs as well so that we can have a look at the logs and that their problem is reproducible if I then run the code as well, right? And then um, we, write a report, um, they have to sum up these things. There's a template for doing that that helps a lot, but there's still a lot of scope to, <clears throat> um, to um, infuse language. And so I sometimes need to rein them back in because when they're really fed up with badly written code that costs them hours of, of doing stuff, uh, it shows in some of their descriptions. But we do teach them that um, there is no such thing as bad code. There is just code that doesn't work. Uh, now, if code doesn't work 20 times, the message is obvious, but you stick with the obvious that it just doesn't work. Um, so, um, and the other thing that they see when describing that is that there's, they actually live the difference between a well-structured project and those that aren't quite well-structured. Because when they get lost, that's what the report will say. Okay, a few things. Um, this is fundamentally a job for them. So it's not designed as a student education project, um, but there is, um, I think, student development going on in the lab and a few other things that I'll point out here. We observe fairly rapid gains in maturity and autonomy. Um, they get exposed to all this rough world, not the finely, uh, finely tuned world that achieves an, uh, a pedagogical goal, which I think is still necessary, but here is the raw wild world of what goes out on there. <clears throat> we also promote a lot of peer-to-peer -peer interaction. It doesn't happen quite as much as I'd like it to be, but um, we do have the notion of team leads. We do have the notion of pre-approvers, which are recruited from among the students uh, to sort of be first reviewer of the report before it gets to my desk or the graduate student's desk. 
Um, and we regularly involve them with some sort of experimental procedures, trying to optimize the workflow that we have, trying to figure out new ways that we can then throw back at the researchers and say, try this out yourself, and then we kind of get back to it. And we ask them to also share their experiences. We've had some data science students show us how Google Colab works because they had encountered it, I had not encountered it, and we had a paper that used Google Colab. So how should I think about reproducibility of something on Google Colab and things like that? Uh, so we, we draw on their overall experience. Um, and I think that's, that's an important part of this as well. They contribute, not the, the biggest part, but they contribute to the overall lab as well. Okay. Um, they, um, they need uh, training. And that is something that goes to the bigger picture of should this be part of the curriculum in, in individual classes or should this be a found, foundational course or something like that? <clears throat> I should note that most of these students have not taken data science courses. So they probably would have learned some of this in, in the data science courses, but they're interested in empirical economics and have not yet had data science courses. Uh, that I think reveals something. Um, but there's still things I think that the labs training, it complements other things as well. Um, you, uh, you don't usually get trained on collecting as an undergraduate 15 different data sources. Uh, you don't usually get to run, even if it's at a superficial level, five different software packages um, at, at such a rapid pace that within a semester you will have done all of that. So um, uh, there's, there's a few things that I think that the lab provides that, that don't uh, otherwise come out, out of that. Um, one thing, that I have observed is that the students, despite having internships on Wall Street and all those kinds of things, actually stay until the end. Uh, I, I lose very few, except for the occasional ones who say, I need to concentrate on my senior thesis, too much work, I need to drop the lab. Um, the, um, we, we have currently a survey in the field of the about 70 uh, graduates of the lab and, and collecting information from them. Um, these are some quotes from, from some earlier just ad hoc debriefing. Um, I'll, I'll let you read them yourself, but there, there seems to be a, a variety of skills that they pick up in a lab because it's unstructured. It necessarily is a variety of, of skills that they do, um, but everybody seems to pick up something that they, they like. Um, and I'll stop there and, and open the floor to questions. Oh, and I'll post the slides. There's a bunch of things at the end there. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Stop sharing so we can see. Oh gosh, look at all of the. Which line? Hi, Rohan. Hi, Professor Lars. Um, I have a question about uh, whether you would welcome pre-doctoral students uh, who are not based at Cornell to, to work with you. Uh, I have a bunch of ideas in my head for how that could possibly work um, on a volunteer basis, let's say, or I know a lot of universities like here, the University of Toronto, we have what, what, are, what is known as uh, these elective independent study um, type of courses. So this might be a good motivation for students to work on important projects while earning university credit. For their efforts we have clearly been thinking about that um one of the um observed uh concerns we've had is that we are on a schedule um and that schedule doesn't always mesh with uh volunteers uh, very well and so that's where um paying students um make makes the message clear that you're supposed to do this in a timely fashion versus a volunteer i might have some reticence to serve um, uh, insist that it be it be so timely. That also is, I think, one of my key concerns why pre-publication verification of this kind doesn't fit within an educational exercise as a class exercise or something like that, because the timelines are just not the same. Um, that's not to say that it can't be done, but if you, if I were to transform the entire training I get into a class, 
then I wouldn't do it quite as intensely as I do. I would probably do it a bit more fundamentally because that's what you're looking for in a class. But that also means that at the end of the class, I'll have the skills or in the middle of the class, I'll have the skills uh, and the students um, available. And that at the end of the class, they're gonna leave it again, right? And so it'll come bunched in time. And so it's the, it's the integration into the pre-publication process that makes it a bit of a difficult task to involve volunteers and and in this particular case uh, for now I, I do have some ability to pay others outside of cornell but it's limited in the way that we're structured and that's just because we were trying to figure things out i think long term it has to be something a bit more scalable uh because i i i, I chafe at my my boundaries there and some authors chafe at me sitting on their papers and, and getting them out with delays um Post-publication, that's a very different thing. And so Abel is going to be talking tomorrow about his institute, and there's a few other things out there about how to organize this as a post-publication thing, where you have far more time. You don't have that, that deadline that, that's pushing you forward. But it's, it's, that, it's that integration into the pre-publication part that's, that's a bit worrisome. Um, right, yeah. So I was also thinking of the post-publication. I guess that would be more feasible. Yes, absolutely. And it should happen, and that is ultimately, we do not reproduce every paper. We cannot, right? Uh, something that runs for three months we and uses a super cluster, we can't do that. Um, and so we mark it as time not available. We think all the materials are there and we put it out anyway. We still insist on all the data documentation being there. We do some a preliminary analysis of the code. We think it's complete, but we did not test it the way that we do when a, with a reproducibility run, right? And those are available for the picking. Um, I did see Abel earlier on, but Abel has been bugging me about every two weeks, at least for a paper. Have you done this one? And I might have somebody to do it for you post publication. Um, uh, Jake, did you have a question? Yeah, I, I had a, this is great. Thanks, Lars. You can hear me okay? Yep. Okay. Um, so one question I was, I've been wondering about is what do you do with um, studies like the, the ones from the OES where we can't share the data? Um, who's the third, like, what kind of third party would be trusted in that particular kind of a case? Jake's upset that you've rejected this paper. <laughs> I, no, 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 it did, this has been a theoretical question, although you may have engaged with some of our papers. I don't, I, I don't know. Um, I don't recollect having any of your papers, but at this point, I think I've had just about every editor have a paper in my queue as well. So they've all experienced it somewhere. So what do we treat as a third party? Ideally, it's a third party who has nothing to do with the original authors, right? And who has access to the same code. Uh, so let me bring two examples on the extreme. Uh, one where we didn't actually run the code, but where I sent the paper to a third party. Uh, the author said, oh, we're at treasury and we got access to IRS data and nobody can do that, right? And I said, bullshit. Um, and I sent it to somebody who I know has access to IRS data who is not a treasury. And thus there is no in institutional connection with that because of course there are a few other institutions in the United States who have access to IRS data. Um, and I got meaningful feedback about the data and whether or not the code that they had provided was plausible without necessarily running it, right? And that's, I think, is the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do. Running computer code is just a very cheap way of assessing, do I have everything that's needed? Not, it doesn't do the right thing, but it's complete, right? And if we can't run the code, we have to do some other assessment. And so we're, we're back to making some basic assessments. Do we think we have code for every table out there? And do we think that the data treatment is plausible to do? Other scenarios are, for instance, um, uh, Swedish prison data, okay? Um, so of course it's, it's confidential, but in addition to that, it's subject to the G GDPR. Uh, and so uh, the way that they got access to the data and they, the way that they were willing to set up access to the data was that somebody had to be in Europe. And so I contacted one of my European data editor colleagues. He didn't have time, uh, the thing drew out and I was supposed to go to Portugal for Christmas. And I said, I'll do it, right? And so, there are a variety of ways one can do this. I ended up not going to Portugal because Omicron and all that kind of stuff. So that one remains this way. But since they got all scared that I might do it, my goal is achieved, right? Um, because they must have made sure that their code is reproducible. The third example is where graduate students come into play. And that is when, um, say, we had prison data from some state in the United States. 
And uh, of course, this project took years to come to fruition for the author, but uh, he or she are still working on it. And so this is actively used data. It is still accessible to the author, but the RA long ago graduated. And so a new RA just hired, got as a job, read through the README, commit on your honor, that's the best we can do, that you won't communicate with the author on anything other than data access and give it a try. And generally we get back meaningful answers. We get back that there's a few tables that maybe have a few numbers different and maybe there's something here that doesn't work. Um, mostly it doesn't break, which is a testimony to the fact that data, uh, papers using confidential data are reproducible. They're just not easily accessible, right? Um, how much of that is a function of my threat of calling you out on it is of course anybody's guess. It's, it can't be completely uh, uh, independent of that. Um, but uh, these are all meaningful exercises in terms of assessing, is this complete? Is it a completely uh, independent effort? No, it's not, right? But in some cases it can never be. Um, and I think my key example is we can never fully trust the data provenance chain anyway, because at some point you collected a survey. I have to trust that you didn't fudge the data between the survey instrument and the data file that you give me as saying that that's the confidential one. There's nobody who can verify that unless you maybe outsourced it somewhere to a trusted entity. And what is that trusted entity, right? So uh, that's, that's what we do in those cases. So there is ample scope to do this post-publication, even pre-publication when that's the only goal when there's some connection. Um, and I look forward to incorporating some of those things. Um, can I just follow up real quick? Yeah. I, would you, one, one thought I had had was to try to do almost a pairs programming or screen sharing event where, you know, you're nobody else, but so-and-so has the rights to touch this data, but they have the rights to, you know, do a screen share with somebody, you know, with, with something like that be, um, I mean, I'm not asking for a commitment right away, of course, just kind of, it's, it's yeah, how does that sound? But it, it is subject to many of the same rules, right? Okay. Uh, for instance, I, I know intimately well what goes on at the Census Bureau, and that would be illegal if you do that with consensus confidential data. So I don't want to dangle it out there as an option because under most rules that is illegal or at yeah, least correct. against your terms of use. It also doesn't work when code runs for a long time, right? I mean, you're, you're showing me your code, you might even be showing me a log files. I don't know what to make of a 15,000 line log file. I don't think anybody can, can do that, but if you're able to post it, post it, right? I'll take it and put it into a replication package and we'll just leave it there, right? I don't know to what extent screen sharing helps for many of the cases. It's really rare that we have hard to access data that also runs really quickly. And we get access, we sign a lot of NDAs and data use agreements on with authors who send data to us where then the RA also gets to sign that and runs the code on it, right? And they observe the entire process. They're, they're told you can't put this data on your laptop, you have to go to the R secure computer and all that kind of thing, which for them is new, right? And so that's also to get back to the educational experience here. They get exposed to some of this, they at least hear about it on a regular basis and they may get exposed to it. Other questions, comments? Okay. We're a little over time, so we should. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, thanks very much. For I'll move back to my seat in the audience. <laughs>